The only thing I can say is it, it's not a, in a small way because with God it's always a big way. We just have to be uh, open to that. We've been in this spring series called <clears throat> God Pleasers. And what I've been trying to uh, get across is those people who are obedient to the Word of God those people who by faith, which means beyond their sight, are, are ready and open to be, uh, ob- to be a, a tool in God's hand. Oh, what God could do. Now, we could sit down and we could say, let's brainstorm. Let's think about what we're going to do so that God could be honored. And we could never in a million years come up with a story like Rhonda just told. We could come up with all kinds of things that might be good things. But what we want to live is a life of a God thing. We want to live a a life not to the size of us, but we want to live a life to the side of the God of eternity. Uh, we We can do what we can in our own efforts, and we will always come up short because we're just not enough. Now, that's not a detriment. That's just a reality. Amen? But God can take the small things. And when uh, Rhonda shared that with me, I said, would you be willing to share that with the church? Because I can't tell you, uh, until we can get to the point in time where we quit putting question marks on God, but say, God, you will even use me. And Lord, you're not looking for me to change so that you could use me. But by the blood of Jesus Christ, we're cleansed. We're made whole in Christ. And all we need to, he's not looking for your ability, he's looking for your availability. And if you could just open yourself up, oh, what God can do, amen? Oh, that was weak. Take your Bible, turn to Judges chapter number 6. I want you to not only see it, I want you to grasp it. I want you to be open to something that's bigger than you. There's a God in heaven sitting on the throne who doesn't need your money. He has many beautiful things in this world. He finds joy in all of them. He made you uniquely the way that you are. Every bit of your DNA, every cell that you have, every quirk in your personality, he loves because he loves you. He doesn't make junk. He makes the good stuff. And if we could so just open up ourselves, I hope you're listening. If we could get beyond ourselves, we could find the beginning of God. If we could find humility and let the pride go. If we could have a heaven-sized vision rather than a human-sized hand control. We got enough control freaks. We got enough people who who, who want to have their hand on it and make it happen. And, and, and they can only live their Christian life in their own sight. But oh, what God can do. Oh, what God can do when we go beyond what we think. Now, in I, when I said Judges chapter 6, some of you immediately knew that we were going to be talking about the life of Gideon. And Gile, Gideon is, is an example, and sometimes... Uh, People think of Gideon as one who had little faith and had God had to prove it to him. And that's a misrepresentation of God's Word. Some of us look at Gideon and we just say, well, he, he dwelled on the small. What Gideon did was realize who he was. And he was, he was okay with being small. The problem was is that he thought being small disqualified him. But church, just please hear this. That's the one God wanted to use. There were plenty of people God could have chosen. But Gideon was willing to admit that he was small. And you've heard me say this many times. The blessing of John the Baptist, God said no greater, born of woman. The blessing of John the Baptist was that in his inner spirit he would say, He must increase, I must decrease. And that spirit should be contagious among us. God's not looking us to get good enough for him to use. He's just looking for us to be available for him to use. So I'm not going to go through the whole story because there's really, 
I, I can't tell you how many times I've preached Gideon. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at uh, Judges 6, 7, and 8. But really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to one verse. But I want to read a few verses getting there. But, th but there's really just one verse I want to, to emphasize today. But we will begin reading in verse number 11. If you have your Bibles, would you stand with us in honor of reading God's Word? Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the timber tree, which was in uh, Ophrah, which belonged to Joash. The now I looked up this word three different times, and I even actually looked it up in the Hebrew, and I, I brutalized it every time I, I, I tried it. So uh, I would say, uh, well, I can't even tell you what I would say. Can I just skip that word altogether? Can y'all say amen? <laughs> While his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. God showed up. God came to him. God showed himself to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I just want to emphasize that. That's not how Gideon saw himself, but that's how God saw him. Church, please listen to me. You must be open to not how you see yourself or your mom or your dad saw you or your neighbor saw you or maybe a friend or a boss saw or sees you or that teacher in the third grade. I have a friend of mine who absolutely was, was devastated. He is in his 40s now because a third grade teacher said you'll only be poor white trash. And his whole life, that's how he saw himself, those three words, poor, white, trash. Can we get beyond that? And you're going to have to be open because you may have heard it in your brain so many times. But I just beg of you, today, if maybe before, but if not, today, let's begin to look at ourselves the way God looks at us. God looked at him and said, you mighty man of valor. Now, he had never been that yet, but he was going to be now. Look in verse number 14. Then the Lord, Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Look in verse number 16. The Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. He speaks what has not occurred as if it already has occurred because with God and his will, it's already done. He hasn't lived it out there yet, but yet he is walking it out with the hand of God, the will of God, the word of God, as if it is already done. You shall defeat Look in verse number 27. So Gideon took ten men from among the servants and did as the Lord had said to him. There's going to be a point in time that we're going to quit having to say, one day, my desire is to, we're going to have to get to the place that if we're going to be God pleasers, if we're going to be people who are going to walk by faith and not by sight, that there must be a beginning point, and it must begin with, yes, Lord, yes, right now, I will be obedient. Now, I want you to look down in verse number 33. Then all the Midianites and the Amalekites, the people of the east, gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. The enemy's coming. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew the trumpet. Let's pray. Father, I pray that this is your powerful word, and I pray that you will take this small instrument. And Lord, may my, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing unto you. I pray that I will not get in the way, but I will follow your way. And Lord, I want your will and your way for your glory. And I pray that that is the prayer of this church. And Lord, I thank you for those that have come today. And Lord, I don't know to whom all that you will be speaking, but you have laid this on our hearts. You've given, 
Ron, did he give the testimony to this morning that, that this is the way that we should walk? And Father, I pray that we would be able to receive your word, not just for someone else, but Lord, I pray that the word be applied and that we would be willing to say, yes, Lord, yes, I believe, I trust, and Lord, I'm willing to walk it out today. Here I am, Lord, use me. Here I am, Lord, use me. So, Lord, may this word not come back void. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Verse 34 is the verse that I want to look at. I cannot tell you how many times I have cruised this scripture. I cannot tell you how many times I have looked at it. But yet, this week, as I was looking at this, I paused. You know, I, I love it when God hits pause. And I backed up and I read it again. And I'm like, Lord, really? And, and this word that I had gone by so many times, it began to, to I don't even know how to say it. It began to, to vibrate in my spirit. And, and it began, began to become alive within me. And I looked at it, and the more that I looked at it, the more that it blessed me. Because it says in verse 34, the spirit of Jehovah, the Numa in the New Testament, this is the Old Testament, the spirit, the living spirit of God came upon Gideon. Now I understand that on the day of Pentecost, when God sent his spirit, it, it rested upon the people. We live in New Testament times. We live in the cross forward. And when we come to that place in time in our life that we understand that Jesus Christ is God's Son who came to earth to die on the cross of Calvary, he, he gave his life a ransom for us to take away our sins. But when he gave his life, the, the physical death ended. They put him in a, a, a borrowed tomb. But God brought back to life with his spirit. The same spirit of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, when God said, let there be, and the spirit of God took those words and made it come alive. That same spirit is what God did within us. When we ask the Lord, come into my life, forgive me of my sins, save me, all my life I give to you. The Holy Spirit of God leaves the portals of glory, sent from the throne of heaven. Jesus says yes, and the Spirit of God comes to live within us. And he is ours, and we are his. And it's not a one moment, one day, way back then. It is a life-changing event. The Spirit of God, listen, I don't know how to say it any other way. It rests within us. In the New Testament, we're going to look at this, but it says we are clothed. I put my coat on when I came up here. I had it all sideways and crooked, and Lynn had to straighten it out for me. But I, I'm clothed with a coat. And I've got clothes on underneath that. But the first thing that you see is that which is on the outside. When the Spirit of God comes, He clothes us on the outside, but it begins on the inside. Church, listen, I've shared this three weeks in a row now. Whenever there's a wound, if I cut my hand here and it's wide open, we want healing, but the healing begins on the inside out. When you ask the Lord to come into your heart and to your life, he comes on the inside. Are you good? And it begins to manifest itself to the outside. I was 10 years old. I didn't know what all I needed to repent of. I lied. I stole. I wanted my will, my way. I did not honor my father and my mother. I would say anything that I needed to say to get what I wanted. I was a normal 10-year-old child. But God took me as I was, cleansed me, and I love this word, to the uttermost. He cleansed me. Now, church, it was not a one-time event 
that was meant to not affect my life until I died and then I would go home to heaven. I praise God for John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Praise God that I'm going to heaven one day. Praise God that he's preparing something for me. Praise God that there is something that is uniquely mine that I have from him. That my eternal life is with him. That if I live the eons of eternity, I will always be his. He will always be mine. But that's that's the, the, the continuation of what happens then. But he saved me. He didn't take me to heaven. He left me here for there to be an opportunity for me to grow in the grace of God. So many Christians are looking for a one-time experience so that they can be cleansed and forgiven and, and, and set apart for God so that they can go to heaven one day. The Christian experience is so much more than that. It is daily walking, a day-by-day -day relationship. It is a circumstance-by-circumstance -circumstance yielding. It is an opportunity to see God as big and strong and mighty and loving and kind and helpful and seeing ourselves in our frailty in our weakness, in our pride, in our haughtiness, in moving away from that. If you look at Brian and all you see is the outward effects, and by the way, they're there. I've got all kinds of junk. So do you. You may one day see part of it and you say, I can't believe Preacher Brian did that. I can because I do it all the time. But every day, and this day, this day, I awoke. And I had the opportunity in that moment to take my spirit to him. And in that moment, I had the opportunity to begin my day with him. And we can talk about it in many different ways. We could talk about putting on the armor of God so we, we can stand against the wiles of the devil. We can talk about it in many ways. But this word here is extremely descriptive. When it says here in Judges 6, 34, when it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, the word come upon let me, let me share a few different translations, and I'll share what this word means. Well, let me share the word first. The word means to come. To come means to dress. It means to wear, to clothe. It means to put on or to be clothed. So literally what this verse is saying is that the Spirit of the Almighty God and dressed Gideon up. The CSB version says the Spirit of the Lord enveloped Gideon. The New Living Translation and the Revised Standard Version says it this way. The Spirit of the Lord took possession of Gideon. The English Standard Version said the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon. The New NET said the Spirit of the Lord took control of Gideon. Colossians one twenty seven says, Christ in you, the hope, the anchor, the standard of glory, Christ in you, Christ in you that he would come and put himself on me like a garment. That I would be warmed by the Spirit of God. That I would be protected. That I would go forward not in my own strength, 
but in the Spirit of God. I love our military, and, and, and I love that there are those in the military, they have a uniform. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Say amen. amen. And they come in as a grunt, right? And they become, after a point in time, a private first class. And they'll begin to work their way up. And as they do, there will be badges that represent actions in their life where they have now, now they don't give those out just for time served they give those out for being faithful to taking the orders that have been placed upon them and being faithful for it and it's not one person that wins the battle it, it is having the commander-in-chief that puts all these things together God can do whatever he so chooses to do because he is God. Amen? Amen? But for whatever reason, he chooses to use us. And we are soldiers in the army of God. And we go from battle to battle. And we put on the uniform of the Holy Spirit of God. We are clothed. We are enveloped. He takes possession of us. And that which is on the inside begins to heal and move outwardly. And as we become obedient, as we become people of faith, as we begin to walk out what God has placed before us, we are used in his mighty kingdom's work. And it puts a smile on his face. Galatians 2.20 says this, I am crucified. I'm dead. I am crucified with Christ. He died for me. I'm not greater than the master. I will die to this old life with him. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And I love the old King James version of this because I actually think the old King James does it better than the new King James. The old King James says, In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Not by my faith in the Son of God, but by the faith of the Son of God. You see, I believe it's from faith to faith. I believe it's from glory to glory. I believe every day I wake up with an opportunity to be clothed by God, to be obedient to whatever he's placed him before me to do. It may be a small thing in your eyes, but it's a, it's a step of obedience. It may be something that he's asking you to do, and you want to say, why, Lord? I don't understand. But if you're going to be clothed by him, then you're going to be open to whatever it is that he says and do. As a soldier in the army, you need to say, yes, sir, and do it quickly. And you need no questions at all. And the thing that we look in Gideon's life is we say, well, he doubted. No, he grew. When the angel of the Lord first came to him, he said, don't leave. Don't leave, please. Don't leave. He said, I won't leave. And he goes back and he, he, he puts a meal together. And he brings, he gets the unleavened bread and the, and the, and the meal and the, the, the meat and the, and the broth and, and takes it to him. And, and the angel of the Lord says, put it there on the rock. Put the, the, the meat and the bread and pour out the broth. And, and he did. And the, the angel of the Lord took it and consumed it. And when he saw the evidence of God, something grew within him. Now, in this particular frame, he has now accepted that God wants to use him. Smallest of all of them, smallest tribe, smallest one in the family, the, the least of all, but yet now he's ready to step up. Because look what it says here in verse 34. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew the trumpet. He took the shofar. He, he took the, the ram's horn. And he blew it, and when, it was a, a, a sure sound. Please hear this. When they heard that noise, they knew what they were supposed to do. And everybody else came behind. We need some people to pick up the shofar once again and start heralding that now is the time. This is the place. God has moved it to this. Please, New Hall, and hear the shofar of God to say that now we must come together to do what God has placed for us to do, individually and collectively. Oh, but Gideon 
had this thing with the fleece. You know, I don't think God's threatened by that in any way, shape, form, or fashion. With all the junk that we've heard, I don't think it's a big deal to say, God, is this really you? If you're thinking that Gideon's doubting, no. Gideon stood forward and did exactly what God asked him to do. Matter of fact, what God asked him to do, he took the army and he shrunk it twice. He took the army and got it down to 300. He was willing to walk it out by faith. It wasn't that he was saying, oh, Lord, prove this to me. But he was just saying, I want to make sure that it's you and not me. Are y'all good with that? And the only, oh, listen now, you're listening. The only way that you're going to do that is start being an obedient in the small. There was a man that was after God's own heart. You might know him by David. When he was a teenager, God had a plan for his life. And I don't know how many songs he wrote out there in the fields, spending time with the sheep, just the shepherd boy. But there's something that stirred within him. God began to do a growing work in his life. Oh, there may be a, a bear or a lion come along. But listen, as those things came, he was obedient. How many of y'all want to go fight a bear? I would do my best to outrun one in Jesus' name. And as out of shape I, as I'm in right now, I'd need the help of the Lord in it. Amen? But he had a responsibility that he couldn't leave. Can you, are y'all good with the fact that God did through him what he could not do on his own? Are y'all good with the fact that God started into small things and grew him into bigger things? Are you good with the fact that he was all right going up against a Goliath with the same thing that he used to protect the sheep against the bear and the lion? Are y'all good with that? Are you good with the fact that before he actually went out and killed Philistines, he began with one? But he was, as God took him from the one, God took him to the many. Are y'all good with that? Are you good with the fact that he made him the general of the army? Are you good with the fact that he made him the king of Israel? Was David always smart? No, he was human. He was human. But listen, we know two times in Scripture that David messed up mightily. Both times is when he got away from Christ in him, the hope of glory. Two times in his life it became about what he wanted. He lost his humility. God always begins with humility, not pride. And when he lost his humility, he found himself in a bad place. But the thing I love, the thing I love about David, when Nathan said, you are the man, it broke him. And he never went that way again. It's not a matter of if we're going to have mistakes in our life. Are we ready to progress being clothed by God? Growing in the grace of the Lord, from glory to glory. Are you good with that? We don't have time, church, to sit on the sidelines. We don't have time. We don't have time. We don't have time to wait until we're good enough. A man's gift are not the measure of his power. The secret of the power is the God that is within him. And Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the earth. I'm with you always. Y'all take comfort in that? That means when God's Spirit speaks, He's with you. When God gives that small statement of obedience that He asks you to do, He's with you. My wife's going to do two year olds tonight. Bless you. He'll be with you. Amen. You've changed a few diapers in your day, haven't you? You're qualified. Amen. How many of you have been asked to do something and you thought, well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. 
Is that true? Is that all of us? Have you ever awakened with trepidation? Um, last week, a friend of mine was his last service at his church, and they had an 8 o'clock service. So before I came here, I went to that church service, and I was with him. And uh, he is a great soul winner. He loves, he loves souls. He loves telling the story of Jesus with people. And I love that about him. I really do. But he stood up in front of the entire audience and he said, of all the people I've led to the Lord, he said, every time I'm put into a circumstance and I know that I need to speak, he said, I'm fearful every time. I'm fearful every time. The only difference is the fear doesn't keep him from doing what God's called him to do. He does it anyway. I'm sure David was scared with a bear. I'm sure he was scared when he stood before Goliath. Them bony knees were probably knocking, don't you think? He was probably scared when he was the leader of the army and had other people's lives in his hands then. But yet God never let him lose a battle. The little shepherd boy who becomes king. And all we see are the Gideons of the world. How small. How small. I wonder if we could just begin to say, I want to be a God pleaser. And it's got to begin with one step of obedience at a time. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Father, I thank you that I was obedient when you called me unto yourself and that I let you do for me what only you could do. You saved me. But it, you, you didn't just save me for heaven. You saved me for a relationship of walking with you, of being with you. Father, I pray that if there's anyone in this place that's trusted you as their Lord, and they're waiting for heaven. Lord, may we be about your business. Lord, I know this is Sunday morning, and I know we're here because we love you. But Lord, awaken the army of your people. And may we be awakened to the opportunity that, to not to brainstorm what we can do for your kingdom, but just to be obedient, to be clothed with Christ and Christ alone, to go out in the power of God and your power alone to be obedient in the small as well as the great. Awaken your army of faith. Lord, may we put a smile on your face. Lord, let it begin in me. Father, may we run from darkness and run to you. Lord, be with us, not just quietly, but loudly in our spirit. Lord, teach us what it means to trust you and to believe in action in life. Lord, uh, thank you for giving us a second chance and all the many chances that have followed because some of us have fallen by the wayside. Some of us, of us have been wounded in battle and we have the scars to show for it. But Lord, I just pray that we would be faithful until the end, until we do see you face to face. Oh, what a Savior. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you that when we see you, we never have to leave again. But until then, my, uh, my soul will go on singing. Until then, with, with, with Lord, your love, I'll carry on. Father, help us today to, be, to begin to be the people of God that you called us to be. The small step of obedience. Let it begin. Oh, God, rock it into our hearts, deep within us, that we would be clothed with you and only you. Lord, give us freedom during this time of the invitation to accept. May doubts fly away. Lord, like Isaiah, may we say, here am I, Lord. Use me, send me. Father, begin the work today. And Lord, if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, may they begin by being obedient as well, not letting anything get in the way, but praying unto you and accepting the free gift of salvation that you so freely give. Oh, Lord. Jesus be Jesus in this room today. In your name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us? Hearts open, hearts free, the altar's open.
I'll be here to help you in any way that I can. 